Thank you for joining us for today's ASPPH Presents webinar, a framework for educating health professionals to address the social determinants of health, featuring three members of the Committee on Educating Health Professionals to Address the Social Determinants of Health, convened by the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. The committee members will present and discuss the recently released framework for how the education of health professionals for better understanding the social determinants of health could be strengthened across the learning continuum. This high-level framework for health professional education will contribute to more effective strategies for improving health and health care for underserved individuals, communities, and populations. This webinar is part of the 2016 ASPPH Presents monthly series, which has been designed as a service to CEPH accredited ASPPH member schools and programs of public health. A few housekeeping items of note. While you are in listen-only mode and your lines have been muted, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation by using the chat or question box. We will address your questions at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the ASPPH website in the archived webinar section soon. Additionally, this webinar has been approved for one hour of CPH continuing education credit. Our speakers today are Sandra Lane, the Laura J. and L. Douglas Meredith Professor of Teaching Excellence. She is a professor of public health and anthropology at Syracuse University and a research professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Upstate Medical University. She received her PhD in medical anthropology from the joint program at the University of California at San Francisco and Berkeley and an MPH in epidemiology from the University of California at Berkeley. Her research focuses on the impact of racial, ethnic, and gender disadvantage on maternal, child, and family health in urban areas of the United States and the Middle East. Dr. Lane has developed a model that links a community participatory analysis of public policy with pedagogy called CARE, or Community Action Research and Education. Her CARE projects include food deserts in Syracuse, lead poisoning in rental property, health of the uninsured, and her current project on the neighborhood trauma and gun violence. Julian Fisher is an experienced policy advisor specializing in public health and the environment. He has work experience in a diverse range of professional environments and geographical locations, covering Europe, Tanzania, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, Falkland Islands, and Antarctica. Within various sectors and organizations, including international public health policy and advocacy, health profession management, undergraduate and postgraduate education, both classroom and web-based. He is currently based at the Medical School Hanover working in a consultancy cooperation with the World Health Organization. Dr. Fisher earned his BDS from Birmingham U University, his MSc from Stellenbosch University, and his MIH from Charité University. Our third presenter, Laura Magana Valadares, is the academic dean of the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico. For the last 10 years, uh, she has been leading the most important educational and technological innovation of the school in its 92 years of existence with wide regional impact. Dr. Magana Valadares has a master's degree in educational technology and a PhD in educational administration from Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C. She has more than 30 years dedicated to higher education in public and private universities in Mexico, educational organizations in the United States, United Nations programs, and NGOs in Central America and Europe. Her research interest is in learning environments and the use of technology in education. She is a member of the National System of Researchers of Mexico and the State System of Researchers. She's also an active member in several community educational organizations. Thank you for being here, Sandy, Julian, and Laura. Hello, and welcome. Um, I'm Sandy Lane, and um, I'm the first speaker to introduce the first 13 slides of our framework. So this is a framework for educating health professionals to address the social determinants of health. Uh, first, let me just get to the next slide. Sorry, the slides are moving a little bit slowly. Oh, there I am. I'll move to the next slide. I want to thank the sponsors of the study. You'll see on the very next slide that there's a whole huge number of sponsors. and. Um, one of them is the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health that's also sponsoring this webinar, and so we especially thank them. Um, we also want to thank the Global Forum co-chairs, Susan Scrimshaw, who's the president of the Sage College, Colleges, and Malcolm Cox. Um, the next slide you'll see uh, is the list 
it's a very large list, and we're very, very grateful for the number of programs that uh, participated in sponsoring uh, this work. And OK, so the charge to the committee. Um, the committee was pu pulled together to be a diverse committee of people of different specialties and uh, to be a, a committee that represented the global set of health professional specialties. So we have people, um, physicians, uh, physician, we have uh, nursing, people representing nursing, people representing public health, dentistry, uh, the WHO world, and uh, multilateral and multinational organizations, uh, people representing um, uh, the United States public health, and others. Um, and we specifically did this um, so that uh, this framework that we developed would be relevant and would be seen as relevant by people from a wide variety of disciplines around the world. Um, so the next slide you'll see uh, presents the committee. And I'm very, very grateful uh, to um, have served on this committee. It was, I'm sorry, it was really um, one of the more interesting experiences I've had in many, many years. Um, each of the people brought a, an incredible wealth of uh, knowledge, and everybody just rolled up their sleeves and worked really hard together. Um, so I, I had a wonderful time on this committee. Um, the committee uh, commissioned uh, a background paper. Uh, Professor Sarah Villam from the University of Ghent completed that paper, and that was to look at all of the published literature in a number of different languages, I think European languages. Um, I'm not sure if we did it in other languages, but a number of different languages um, to see how much had been published about the use of the social determinants of health in health professional education and how much had been evaluated. Now, what we found in that background paper was, you know, not a whole lot had been uh, done on this yet um, at, in a way that was published and evaluated. Um, as you'll hear from the members of the committee, part of that had to do with the fact that the social determinants of health itself is a fairly new concept. And so maybe it hasn't had quite enough time uh, to be integrated formally into health professional education in a way that would then be evaluated and taught. We did a lot of literature search for this. Every member of the committee participated in that, and um, the IOM, the Institute of Medicine staff, who were just wonderful to work with, participated in that. And in those literature searches, we looked at uh, things that came before the social determinants of health, but were actually elements of the social determinants of health. So we looked at, there's a, a, a variety of schools around the world, uh, for example, University of Jazeera, uh, medical schools and nursing schools uh, that have been started from the ground up as problem-based, community-oriented uh, programs. And so we drew on those experiences quite heavily, and those experiences had indeed been published. They were published too early for them formally to incorporate the social determinants of health as a unified concept, but they incorporated many, many of the elements of the social determinants of health. We had an open meeting in which we sought public testimony, and then we had a number of other uh, individuals come and speak to us about uh, the experiences of their universities, about the needs of their disciplines um, for this sort of education. And then uh, they also shared with us personal experiences, as did the members of the committee. So now on to the next slide. The crux of this is the social determinants of health. And the World Health Organization defines the social determinants of health as the conditions under which people um, are born, grow, work, live, and age 
and as well as the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of life. Um, some members of our committee felt that this uh, was only a first step, however good it was as a first step. And we wanted to add health inequities, um, which are the unfair, and some people call them unjust, and I think that's very, very important. Uh, Dr. Troutman on our committee um, definitely emphasized that avoidable differences in health between groups of people within countries and between countries that stem from the social determinants of health and result in stark differences in health and health outcomes. So because this is a global report, uh, we make the a strong point that the people who suffer health inequities and health injustice in various countries may well differ. Um, certainly in the United States, we tend to conceptualize this as racial and ethnic disparities in health. But there are also rural disparities. There are disparities based on speaking other languages. There are disparities that Native Americans face. In other countries, it, it, it well differs. But um, we realized that um, in, in, in almost every place that we considered, um, there are individuals and groups that face health injustice. Um, health disparities that are avoidable, potentially preventable, and, um, and could be improved, health situations that could well be improved if the health professionals caring for those populations understood how to take action um, and how to make a difference. So, on to the next slide. I think I've gotten ahead of myself here. But in the United States, we tend to call this disparities. Um, this has been criticized because disparities doesn't seem to, uh, to many people, um, really get at the injustice um, and the unfairness of having health differences, um, geographic health differences, health, dif health, uh, health differences in survival, in um, health status, in um, the, when a person gets cardiovascular disease, for example, um, that differ because of lifelong discrimination, uh, discrimination in housing, in employment, in education, and can be intergenerational. So we call it disparities, but um, in our committee we've been thinking of it more uh, deeply as health inequities, which is, as you see on this slide, the term that is now the term of art in the United Kingdom. So um, what we were tasked with, the concept of social determinants of health was developed way before our committee met, what we were tasked with was taking that concept and applying it to innovative methods of educating health professionals. Um, and so what we believe is that without un addressing the underlying causes of disease and ill health, these disparities, these injustices will continue. And we believe that the people that who can be educated to start addressing these disparities are health professionals. We define health professionals very broadly. Um, and uh, this is a very important point. Health professionals in our definition include social workers. Um, they include uh, community health workers. Um, obviously, the well-known clinicians, doctors, nurses, dentists, pharmacists. Um, they also include um, health policy professionals, public health workers, um, people who uh, uh, provide uh, lactation consultants, for example. So we didn't, we intentionally didn't narrow uh, the definition of health professionals because we wanted this to be able to be used by any group. That doesn't mean that it will be used in the same way by every group. It will have to be fine-tuned, and it will have to be um, modified uh, to fit into uh, the education of each group 
and a second point, the lifelong learning. So continuing education and um, informal and formal continuing education in terms of um, workshops, seminars, in-service education of health professionals. Um, but we do believe that the social determinants of health should be part of all health professional education and training. Now we mean by this, in, in the past and in the um, experience of many members of the committee, um, we could cite lots of um, courses that were elective courses that were tacked on as a kind of a nice thing, a nice extra thing to do, especially being done by uh, professors who had a lot of energy and perhaps in many ways not much support from their institutions. And this is not how we see it. We uh, ideally would like this to be integrated broadly throughout curricula and uh, throughout uh, lifelong learning. That having been said, we realize, and our framework allows for, um, the integration of this going a step at a time, because we realize that many institutions may not uh, fully be able to integrate this throughout all of their curriculum um, immediately. Um, Based on this um, integration of the social determinants of health, we don't want this to just be the dissemination of knowledge. We don't want this to be um, the traditional passive learning. Paolo Ferreri uh, defined passive learning as the banking model of education, by which he said that in the traditional model, students listened to the lectures by the professors, and essentially the professors instilled into the students a set of facts that the students would then return to the professors on tests, the banking model. And this is not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is a new model of education that is very innovative and one, and this is absolutely key, that helps students learn how to take action. Because learning about the social determinants of health without taking action will not make any difference for the people that are suffering. So how do people take action? That's one of the big uh, questions. We realize that there are constraints on how people can take action in their careers. Certainly very, very busy clinicians who see patients one at a time uh, may have a great, uh, have more difficulty taking action. Um, and we're not expecting clinicians in settings like that to take action alone. But if they see something, if they know that there's something that is causing many of their patients to have poor health outcomes, we would like this education to inspire them and support them and give them the tools to be able to link with other groups in the community to take action. So now I will turn it over to my colleague, Julian Fisher. Uh, hello and uh, welcome from, from Hanover. We've got the, the great pleasure today to have your president with us in my, my hometown. So um, he probably says hello as well to, to uh, all his uh, friends in the States. Um, my job is to really now take you through some of the background in the development of the model and uh, the conceptual framework and how um, educators play an absolutely pivotal role. One of the exciting things about social determinants at the moment is there is a lot of momentum behind um, having social determinants ed um, education integrated into health workforce education. And in actual fact, social determinants is one of the key leadership priorities of the World Health Organization, and perhaps later I can um, speak a little bit more about some of the uh, activities and initiatives that will be presented to the World Health Assembly uh, next month in Geneva. Um, educators play um, an absolutely pivotal role, um, and the um, creation of lifelong learners, both in terms of the faculty becoming lifelong learners and also their students becoming lifelong learners, 
really reflects some of the thinking that started with the Lancet report in 2010 um, and has been taken up and incorporated into the sustainable development agenda with the um, linkage between health and education. So SDG 3 on education uh, on health and SDG 4 on uh, edu uh, education. And this really, um, this idea of lifelong learning that the really speaks very well to social determinants because the social determinants cannot be taught or learned in the class. This is really um, taking um, uh, learning experience out into the communities, so experimental learning, um, community-based learning, but also most more than community-based learning, it's community-engaged learning. So really looking at engaging with the community, having the community come in uh, also into the university and uh, look at uh, curriculum development around the social determinants of health. So it is very much a, a close partnership uh, between the communities that the institutions serve and also the education of those uh, future health workers that will work in those communities. And as we start to look at um, the types of um, educational uh, instructional um, uh, initiatives, we really need to move uh, to interprofessional education, but perhaps take that one step further and look at intersectoral in, uh, education, because obviously social determinants are going to require people to work with other sectors that uh, influence health. Um, and alongside the development of curriculum and um, the advancement of lifelong learning, there is a real requirement for an enabling environment of, of these institutions, of educational institutions, for faculty. Because the edu educators and faculty are absolutely pivotal, vital, um, for this education that the report is uh, proposing. Um, we really do need to look at institutions, as I say, creating an enabling environment to allow uh, faculty to develop, so having faculty development initiatives, leadership programs, and also career pathways to make it attractive and encourage people to go into teaching and educating on the social determinants. And in actual fact, the WHO has pr uh, produced some guidelines on transformative education, which also has three recommendations on faculty development, really highlighting how important faculty, faculty development and leadership are in uh, uh, this area. As I mentioned, partnerships absolutely key and fundamental to addressing the social determinants of health. And the educators are really at a, a bridge, a pivotal place in this education continuum and also, as uh, Sandra was saying, in addressing the social determinants of health. Because um, public health educators, population health educators um, are really required to uh, look at the structural determinants of, uh, of health. So looking at the social political context, looking at some of the systems, health systems, education systems, transport systems issues, but then also reaching out into um, the community, knowing how to uh, relate to the community, engage with the community, and also colleagues in architecture, in transport, to bring a multi-dimensional, multi-stakeholder partnership into play in this, uh, in this education. Um, we also um, took from the Lancet report and also a lot of the work that WHO has been doing, the idea of transformative learning. And this again is one of the key fundamental um, paradigm shifts that we're going to need to look at if we're going to start to really embed and integrate social determinants education into health workforce and health professional education. And this, as Sandra said, shifts um, the, the emphasis from passive um, learning to much more hands-on active uh, learning where there's uh, real engagement of both the communities and the, the students and the faculty in creating a, a learning environment. And the idea is to move again um, from creative uh, towards creative and critical thinking. So it's not just being critical, it's also looking at how we can be creative, learning from other um, situations, learning from other communities. And that is where innovation, social media come into play because now we've got the opportunity as um, the health, public health challenges become global, we need to reach out and have an understanding and um, an exchange with communities 
um, around the world so that we can become better educated and advance our understanding of social determinants not only in our own environment but also globally. And these will require um, a real um, shift again in looking at what types of competences we will be re requiring. It will require uh, much more um, analysis and synthesis of information from all sorts of different levels, from a micro level, individual patient level, meso level where we're looking at um, communities, and the macro level and the, uh, um, the broader community level, bringing in all those policy um, uh, issues. So it's quite a, um, a much more complex and independent uh, learning environment. Also the transversal skills, um, communication skills will come into play, knowing how to um, work with policy makers, but at the same time be able to communicate with community members and individual patients. And as I mentioned, many of these um, issues now are becoming global in nature, so the idea of global public health or global health is also going to be important and also should be brought into um, education and training of health professionals and health workforces um, of the future. And again, that's looking at the health in all policies um, uh, material that, that from the WHO and again as uh, Sandy has says if we're going to take action on the structural determinants of health people and health workers and health professions have gotten to know and be educated and understand how to advocate and take action uh, in the policy arena as well as uh, the, um, the community. As part of this study and quickly mention this as uh, uh, Sandra has spoken about it we looked at um, um, Literature, literature found 33 uh, papers. However, the papers really were um, very broad and didn't really give us the information that we perhaps hoped we would get. And this really highlights the need for more research, uh, both in health policies and systems research, but also in educational research, looking at um, education in education institutions and looking at the outcomes. So um, again, shifting away or um, uh, balancing out the emphasis on health uh, research with educational research so that we can look at the training and education of health workers as uh, a part of um, delivering better health outcomes for everyone. And this was our really our conclusion as a committee. We came to the conclusion that there was a need for a much more holistic, consistent, coherent structure that aligns both health and education and also all the other uh, sectors um, so that we could work in partnership to, need, uh, to meet and address the needs of uh, the communities that we serve. And this is the framework the committee developed. As you will see, lifelong learning um, is at the very heart, at the very center of the, uh, the framework. We have the three domains that um, Lara will be speaking about, education, organization, and community. And the reason that there is a um, um, a flow of the blue around is that we saw that these three domains were in, in, uh, linked and interdependent and they all had if you like primary areas of, of responsibility so for instance education that's experimental learning collaborative learning looking at an integrated curriculum and continual professional development the community again reciprocal commitment from the community looking at community priorities and community engagement and as I mentioned, critical um, organization involvement, um, the buy-in represented by clear statements in the vision and mission statements, but a supportive organization environment and um, uh, looking at integrating social determinants. And those will um, shift and move around depending on the context and um, uh, different players. So it's a very much trying to present it in a, um, a structured way but understanding it as a very dynamic environment. And then we took that, can, that framework into the, uh, a larger arena um, adapted from the WHO um, Commission on the Social Determinants and other sources. And this really looks to speak to what Sandy has mentioned, taking it from the educational arena, so advancing the understanding of health professionals and health work students, workforce students, about the social determinants and saying yes but we want to create uh, a workforce that is able to to take action to impact on equity and health and well-being so we move to the right there you can see it's looking at a, a workforce that can address the social determinants um, as it comes over in that lower of the two arrows 
in the population that they serve. So looking at um, serving those communities um, and addressing the social determinants of health. And the reason there's a bi-directional arrow is obviously recognizing that those health workers and health professionals are actually a part of that same community. So it is not a, an abstract um, exercise. Those health workers are actually a part of those community. Um, and so that hence the unidirectional, uh, the bi-directional arrow. And then again, as I mentioned, those addressing the social determinants of health, but we need to address the structural determinants of health. So the higher of the two arrows, again, representing the need for um, health systems, um, uh, um, population uh, interventions, looking at the socio-political um, context and understanding the health and all policies perspective, um, and again, represent, uh, recognizing that those very same um, political and policy um, and socio-political um, influences will influence the health workforce and their ability to address the social determinants of health. And there is a need for um, uh, monitoring and evaluation um, as a part of that educational uh, continuum. So this again represents not just a snapshot of uh, pre-service or undergraduate education, Again, going back to that very first slide, seeing this both in terms of the faculty and the health workforce student uh, and later a professional, seeing this as a part of a continuum so that as you accumulate professional experience, you um, advance through the same um, conceptual model but obviously have different um, entry points and in influences throughout your professional career. And again, recognizing that um, if you look at the, the um, population, there is a transition from the population into education and education into the population. So understanding that there is a dynamic um, between the education uh, and those educators will often return to those communities um, and become community-based um, themselves um, to recognize the, the um, if you like, the holistic dynamic of the of the conceptual model. So that is really um, putting the conceptual model um, in, in uh, the, the framework rather inside the conceptual model. And now I will hand over to my colleague, Laura, who will um, look up the three individual domains and go into more detail. All right. Thank you very much and hello, good afternoon. Uh, greetings from Mexico. Uh, I have the honor and the privilege to actually uh, end up with uh, uh, having like a summary or a conclusion because their report also have recommendations. Uh, there we have, I'm going to present three recommendations in terms of the domains and one in regards to the evidence that we need really together with you we need to build. The first domain that we're going to talk about is education. As my colleagues were saying, we really believe that we have to transform the way we are teaching currently all our health professionals if we really would like to move to act on social determinants of health. I think that the very first uh, discussion that we have as a group in the committee was to talk about how we are training our current health professionals. And we talk a lot in terms of that we still have a lot of lectures in the classroom. Although the Lancet report was six years ago in, in 2010, uh, it was out, and we have really made an effort in all our public health schools and all other health professionals try to really um, change the curricula, to work in competencies. We still a lot of work to be done in terms of really believing that learning has to be different if we really want our students to not only understand but to act, especially in the social determinants of health. So we believe, we strongly believe, and you can read completely uh, in the report, that we need to change to, to the learning to be experiential. Not just lectures, not just learning uh, through the books, but we really need to practice what we are uh, teaching. And the students, they need to have experiences, not only the classroom, but outside the classroom too. And that learning has to also to occur in groups, collaborative. Because we, when we talk about social determinants of health, we talk about people, we talk about groups, we talk about relationships. So it's not about just our own learning. So we need to learn to collaborate. We also talk uh, a lot in terms of the curriculum. 
the health professional needs to be more integrated. And we have been talking for years about this, but very small changes and experiences around the world we find to really have really make the difference and to integrate some or part of the curriculum because that's the only way that we can really uh, develop uh, the competencies, the cross-cutting competencies that all our health prof professionals need in order to address the social determinants of health. And we also talk about continuing professional development because there's something uh, uh, there that it needs to continue. It's not just a one-shot thing. We need to start uh, with the formal education, but we need to go all the way to continue education and also uh, integrate uh, the faculty. So the recommendation uh, that, we, that we put in the report in terms of education, uh, it reads like this in the slide, but I just want to pinpoint some of the, the key issues here. First of all, we, we think that this framework is a guide. It's a guide for creating lifelong learners. So the key uh, issues here, or the key words are, is a guide, is for creating lifelong learnings, it's not just one thing, but it's throughout the whole life. We also uh, are talking about appreciation and value, relationships and collaborations. And you're going to see later on how we build a lot in terms of collaborations. Uh, and also to understand and addressing not just the needs, but also the assets of the community. We all, in public health, and we're talking with this community that we already value that community. And that's something that's why the second domain is actually community. So education is one of the domains that there's a lot to read in the report. This is a very short presentation, and, and really we just want you to, to go to the report and read the whole thing. But let me just pinpoint in terms of the community domain, what are the things that you're going to find in the report that we think it was, it was important. Uh, we talk about reciprocal commitment. We talk about how the community also has to be engaged. There's something that the community has to also set their own priorities. It's not that the health professionals go to the community to work in the community. But that, that could be practicum and other things. But when we talk about social determinants of health, it's not just about to talk about them. We need to really integrate community in our own academic setting and together, together as a partner, we have to have the community with us. So that's why one of the recommendations in the report that you're going to find in terms of the community it talks about partnering, it talks about the communities, it talks about to prepare the health professionals to take action, not just understand, but to take action on the social determinants in health. And how are we going to be doing that? Well, working with the community, in the community, but with the community, and also across the communities, and across not just the health professionals, but also educational associations, organizations. And we also talk about the different levels. We, are, we, lo we live in a, in a globalized uh, world, in a very interconnected world, so we need to work locally, but we also need to work regional, globally, and we should apply the concepts embodied in the framework in terms of partnering with communities to increase really the inclusivity and the diversity of health professionals, and we talk a lot, not just the body and the faculty, but the students. We need to have the necessarily uh, a path in order for the students in terms of the diversity of the students that actually reach the health professional that we really want. And the third domain, we talk about the organization domain because we strongly believe that not just one class or one faculty that are really uh, devoted their time in order to do this, but it has to be really a whole commitment. We need that the organizations that we all work for have the vision and the commitment for the social determinants of health. We need to really uh, stress for supportive organizations' environments. So in regard to this domain, in the, in the domain of the organization, we really want to foster and enable environments that support and value the integration of frameworks, principles into their mission, their culture, and their work. We really believe that not, not just the governments, or not just the schools, or not just the educational associations, but we all together, we need to really work, find the ways to work together to, work, uh, to have all of us the commitment in order to act on the social uh, determinants of health. Uh, one of the recommendations when we talk about the building the evidence, that was because we really uh, spent a lot of time trying to have evidence in terms of what is working 
there in the schools or in the communities, in the organizations, and we really have a hard time to try uh, to, to find evidence. So that's one thing that we really, uh, we know that all of you that are participating in this webinar, you are here because you care about social determinants of health. We need you. We need you to build the evidence. It doesn't matter how small we think our experience, our classroom, or our community project we have, but we need to know about that. We need all together to have more evidence in order to, to know the lessons learned, what is working, what is not working, because we really need to move forward this, uh, this issue, and the only way to, to, to go forward is if we know what is working and what is not working. So that's one of the things that we want to share with you and the one your commitment in order to build the case of social determinants of health. We end up by, uh, by, by, by a part that says demonstrating action. How, do, how, we, how can we demonstrate that we are really advancing? So to demonstrate full and equal partnership in terms of the health professionals, the educational associations, the organizations, the community partners, we all should prepare their respective networks because we know that each of us, we have our own networks. But we need to build and to engage networks and networks. We don't want to be working alone. We, we can't work alone. We have to work in a systematic and comprehensive uh, way in order to build the evidence that we have in all the, the areas. To move forward, we strongly believe that we need to develop faculty. We need more faculty uh, uh, development in this is issue, and we know and we think that this is a cross competency among all our faculty. It's not just faculty that knows about the social determinants, because then we're going to be talking about maybe with those faculty, uh, the students are going to learn the facts of the SDH. But we, if we put the SDH as a cross-cutting competency among all faculty, then everybody will really go, going to, to work in their own areas in order to really build uh, the competency. We need to have career pathways, and we really need to reward teaching. Every, all the small and big experiences that all are, are there working, we need to know about them, and we need to reward them, and, and we need to reward them and recognize them formal and informal. We really strongly believe that this is important if we want the faculty to be really supportive of this. And the other area, of course, we always need Fund, right? So funding and investment, and we really want to, to, to put it forward because uh, we need to recognize that governments and ministries have the power to direct health professional education, and then they need to also understand that this is important in order to give funds to continue the advancement, the advancement of SDH. Uh, not, and not only just the governments and the ministries, but also the, the funds from foundations uh, they have an excellent influence through the activities they support. So we think that if we give them the evidence that we really need to support SDH because we are changing the impact that we're doing in the world, they will uh, uh, open more opportunities for funding. Well, let me present to you the whole committee. Uh, as I said, we just have 30 minutes to present, and I think we are past past the time. Uh, this is all my colleagues and it was a really a very nice uh, committee and uh, one of the things that we really want you to do is to download the report. The report we want to give you is right here the link that you can have the complete report and once you read it I think it will be very useful to have uh, a deep conversation on the report. But for now I think we're ready to, to have some of your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandy, Julian, and Laura. Uh, yes, and we are now open for questions. Anyone who would like to submit a question, I please I encourage you to do so now by typing it into the question box. Um, the first question, uh, Julian, I believe it was you who mentioned the importance of interprofessional and intersectoral education. Are there plans to broaden this framework to apply uh, to uh, in these? types of education rather than just health professional? Uh, yes, it's a, a very good question and uh, really speaks to um, the global um, public health agenda. Um, there's the World Health Assembly um, in Geneva in uh, this May, next month, 
where all the uh, ministers of health gather um, for their annual conference on um, health in, in, as I say, with the World Health Organization in Geneva. And one of the um, big issues that's going to be discussed this year is the um, Global Strategy for Human Resources for Health, which contains um, um, strategies for education. And in that, um, interprofessional education and intersectoral education are really key um, elements um, that governments are keen to drive forward. They recognize that if we look at the Ebola crisis or some of the other public health crises that are, are happening, we're going to have to start looking at um, yeah, teamwork, um, um, people who are flexible to work in, in different environments, in, in um, rapidly changing environments, looking to work with policy makers, looking to work with communities. So absolutely, interprofessional education and um, uh, intersectoral education are really very, very high up on the, the global public health agenda at the moment. Wonderful. Um, another question, are there schools that are being highlighted as models to learn from? Was, yeah. Julian, you want to say? I think, well, we, we mentioned uh, this network of um, universities that started some time ago that are listed in the report um, that were started as community-based and problem-based and community-oriented universities. We in the committee have learned from them. There are others. Um, uh, we had a talk from a, 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 a dean from uh, the medical, one of the medical schools in Cuba, um, and that was wonderfully uh, a, a wonderful example of using social determinants of health and having the students move out into the community in the first year and to continue to work intensively with the community. Florida International University in the United States was an example. Uh, the dean uh, of the medical school came and spoke with us. Um, so yes, uh, the report gives more of these examples. Uh, but they are still fairly few and far between, um, and many of the the universities and and the institutions that are that we f felt were um, very interesting examples of what we're talking about um, were were able to be more innovative because they hadn't started as traditional universities. They started sort of from the ground up as these innovative programs. And also, if I may add, um, beyond the schools, I think that there are individual like projects, program, or experiences that we know they are there, and some of them we have the evidence and they are, as Sandy was saying in the report. But this is exactly uh, the issue where we really want to emphasize with you. We need more evidence. If you look at the, at the uh, if you search what is done there already published, is very few experiences that are published, and we know that there have been some experiences just because we know about the schools, we know about the, the program. It's not because we have the, the, the evidence uh, published. So we really need to build the case. So if you know about experience, if you know about a project, if you know about an innovative exercise that a school is doing, please try to, to formalize and publish that experience because we need to build the case. Thank you. Okay, yes, um, just picking up on ahead, that. The, yeah, sorry. There, there are, um, and I think um, um, both Sandra and uh, Laura make, make the point that um, as the issue of social determinants and teaching social determinants in, in health professional education comes more to the fore, um, we'll start seeing um, institutions um, becoming more visible. Um, Northern Ontario School of Medicine, Sambuanga in, in the Philippines, there are many institutions um, that are using perhaps a, a socially accountable model um, to drive forward so, uh, social determinants of education. Um, there are other um, universities in, in South Africa. There's um, uh, universities in India. So there are a lot of individual universities um, being, as we've um, discussed and heard, being very creative and very innovative. It is just a matter of bringing all this together um, and making it um, available to everyone. So I would echo the call that um, it is important for us to 
to understand and hear about all these uh, examples so that we can start to lean, learn from each other and also build momentum to show that it is possible um, in, in a, a very wide variety of contexts to educate people on the social determinants of health and also to take action on those social determinants. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is a little bit of a different tack. What is the most effective way to change the political environment of an academic setting in order to more fully engage with social determinants of health, teaching, and learning? This is a great question. <laughs> we talked a lot about it. Um, we hope that this report that we've produced will go a ways to helping to convince um, the, the, the responsible administrators in institutions. I have to say that um, the medical school next door that I'm uh, affiliated with uh, in, in Syracuse University, next door to us is Upstate Medical University. And as soon as the dean of the medical school heard of this report, I sent it to him seven minutes after it was allowed to be <laughs> disseminated. Uh, he wrote back within, I think, three minutes and asked me to come and speak to the faculty about it. So I would say that the uh, the record that the Institute of Medicine holds in the minds of many people um, and the fact that this is done with um, uh, the, you know, following the Lancet report and following the number of um, uh, reports disseminated by the World Health Organization in this regard, I think that may go a ways to convincing people. The second thing is we hope that there will be funding coming down the pike for this um, so that faculty can apply for funding and uh, that is another thing that helps administrators to see the benefit of this. Julian or Laura? Yes, I mean, I think, um, again, extremely good question. Um, and the other thing is to remember that um, change may not come from within the health sector. It may well come from other sectors. So, for instance, the education sector um, is starting to um, look at, um, through the, the prison um, and the, the, the catalyzing effect of the sustainable development goals, is starting to look at education in a much more broader context and obviously um, health workforce education is part of the education sector. So again, um, it may well be other sectors will influence health workforce education outside the health sector. Um, I think also, um, as I mentioned, the initiatives happening at a global level at the WHO are reflected by national governments understanding that um, the, if you like, the current model um, that we have is very, very good but um, on its own um, is um, not effective in addressing those causes of the causes, as Michael Marmot uh, mentions, and we do need to look at uh, social determinants of education. So I think national governments are also looking to introduce or take up um, global policies that look um, both from the education and health sector that are looking to um, create that enabling environment for faculty to start um, really pushing out and implementing the, the ideas and um, the concepts and the recommendations that we have in the report. Great, and then another question, how does it, you've all mentioned the Lancer report of 2010 multiple times, how does this report build on or differ from that report? I think, um, you know, again, it's, it's a part of uh, um, building momentum. I mean, the Lancet report was a very seminal report. It was reflected in the World Health uh, Resolution on Transformative Education um, in the WHO in uh, 2013. And I think this report um, takes the, the narrative that one step further. And as um, Sandra mentioned, the, um, the, the, the kudos and the, um, the weight that the Institute of Medicine brings 
to social determinants of education is really taking that Lancet report from perhaps being um, a more academic piece that yes, we need to know we need to do something, now really taking it and saying, here are some concrete recommendations that you as faculty, as an institution, can start implementing, can start doing tomorrow. So I think it does take it one step further by really looking at um, providing the framework and the model, so giving that context and giving something, if you like, a little bit of meat for people to start seeing, well, where do I fit in this uh, larger picture? And also with the recommendations, uh, I think the committee hopes that these are very concrete, tangible, doable um, policy and um, activities that, that everyone can get involved in. Um, and I think um, we're all hoping, and the, the evidence seems to be that the report is, is really um, continuing this me momentum and sort of building into this second wave because um, there is a lot of um, need, demand and interest for uh, social determinants of education. Yeah, I could just add that this report adds and builds from the Lancet report. I think that six years ago the Lancet report US gave us a very good report and then a general idea that what needs to be done. And this report actually focused the general idea of the Lancet report in a specific area, which is the SDH, and really concentrates on what we can do in order to change and to act in social determinants of health, but using uh, some of the also the ideas and bring them and strengthen some of the ideas in terms of transformative education. We can remember that that's exactly what we need to do. And some of the things on, 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 that we're talking right right here, it also we're talking in the in the Lancet report. And I think that the change in our schools really takes time. So we need patience, we need con uh, consistency, and we need to take uh, we need to keep on talking about these and showing some of the evidence in order to move our schools in order to be transformative. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Uh, thank you for everyone who joined us today. And thank you to our speakers, Sandra Lane, Julian Fisher, and Laura magana uh, As a As a reminder, this webinar was recorded and will be made available on the ASPPH website in the archived webinar section soon. Please be sure to contact us with any additional questions and to register for the next webinar in the ASPPH Present series. Lastly, the ASPPH will, with the Association of, Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture is co-sponsoring the 2016 Fall Building for Health and Wellbeing Structure City Systems, Systems Conference. Abstract submissions are invited from ACSA and ASPPH communities, as well as non-member practitioners and faculty that address the range of topics related to built environment and human health. The topic areas and more information are available on the conference website. Thank you again to everyone, and have a wonderful day.